true murder. It's a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with you. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. In the late hours of July 22, 1991, Detective Patrick Pat Kennedy of the Milwaukee Police Department was asked to respond to a possible homicide. Little did he know that he would soon be delving into the dark mind of one of America's most notorious serial killers, the Milwaukee cannibal, Jeffrey Dahmer. As the media clamored for details, Kennedy spent the next six weeks, 16 hours a day, locked in an interrogation room with Dahmer. There, the 31-year-old killer described in lurid detail how he lured 17 young men to his apartment where he strangled, sexually assaulted, dismembered, and in some cases cannibalized his victims. In Grilling Dahmer, the interrogation of the Milwaukee cannibal, the reader is taken on a horrifying tour into the mind of evil as Kennedy patiently, meticulously, listened to unspeakable horrors so that a monster would be taken off the streets forever. The book we're featuring this evening is Grilling Dahmer, the interrogation of the Milwaukee cannibal with my special guest journalist and author Robin Maharaj welcome back to the program and thank you so much for this interview Robin Maharaj thank you very much Dan thank you so much um, with this book Grilling Dahmer uh, why don't you tell our audience how you came to be involved with Patrick Kennedy and ultimately involved with this incredible story uh, well, quite a few years ago, uh, probably back about uh, almost eight, nine years ago, um, I, you know, I was working as a freelance writer. I always had a full-time job, but I was always, you know, sort of hungry to be writing all the time, and so I was working as a freelance writer. And I guess it was around the time I turned 40, and I thought, you know, I've been sort of tackling lots of different topics, and it's fa fabulous because you do get to learn about a lot of different things, but I kind of got to a point where I was like, you know what, I just really want to focus on the things that I'm really interested in and I kind of feel like I know a lot about. So true crime, of course, was one of those things, and I thought, I'm just going to try and tackle an article uh, and write a true crime article and just sort of see how it goes. So I chose Jeffrey Dahmer because I had seen something listed, and it was kind of like, you know, the the top 10 most evil people in history and for whatever reason Dahmer was number three so there was like Stalin, Hitler, Dahmer <laughs> and I was like you know oh, I know he was a bad guy I know he did some really monstrous things but really was he the most you know third most evil person in the history of the world so it kind of made me want to explore him a little bit and do some you know background check on him and research a little bit more about the case I mean I was familiar obviously with who Jeffrey Dahmer was and I knew sort of the highlights of the story and, and the crimes that he had been um, you know had been charged with and eventually was in prison for. I didn't really know that much about him, so I decided I wanted to do an article about him. And one of the reasons that I kind of felt a little bit of the difference between him and sort of other killers that, you know, you've profiled in books on your show, um, is I just sort of felt like, you know, this is a guy who he was killing, but it was really a, a means to an end because he was really a necrophiliac and he really just wanted those bodies. And ultimately, really, what he really wanted was companionship. He wanted a person. He wanted somebody there to be with him because he'd never really experienced love. He didn't really like conflict. He didn't really like confrontation. So he didn't really want a true partner, um, someone that, you know, he could be conversing with and, you know, challenging him at all. He just really wanted somebody there who he could talk to and do things with. So, but I felt, you know, his, his place of coming was really out of a place of love, out of a place of need and loneliness. So to me, I thought that's something I want to explore. So I contacted a few people and eventually I found myself in touch with Patrick Kennedy through email and uh, he seemed to be kind of interested in my take on it and he said, you know, I have notes and, and reports and different things that I've kept over all these years. Maybe it'll help you. So as it turned out, he became a a source for my interview when I ended up going down to Wisconsin I met with him we did the interview he showed me all of these notes and everything that he had and we even talked about possibly collaborating on something a book together my 
goal was that, you know, he this is his story and he just needs some assistance to kind of get it through to fruition, finished, and then maybe uh, right. to be looked at by a, a publisher. Um, but as it turned out, five days after we met uh, in Wisconsin, he Patrick had a heart attack and died. Um, so I did eventually go on with my article. I sent it to his widow and she said, you know, you did a really nice job here and I think that you kind of had an understanding of how Patrick felt about Dahmer. Why don't you just take the notes, take whatever you have there and just see what you can do with it. If it becomes a book, great. But she wasn't really prepared to do anything. Like she didn't have the experience. I don't think she really even had the ambition or the drive necessarily to turn this into a book. She said it'll probably just go into a, a desk drawer otherwise, you know. So with that, I said, you know, not only is this an interesting story that should really be told, but it's also now kind of a legacy for Kennedy because to me, he was a detective who just happened to be responsible for interrogating one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. But really, he, Patrick, had an interesting story as well. Yes, yeah, so you talk about his, his background, fourth generation uh, police officer and um, and then his rise in the police ranks itself till that point when he, he was slated for the interrogation of Jeffrey Dahmer by his lieutenant at that time. And what you, after he died and then you corresponded with his widow, really what you were left with was the description, the total description of Jeffrey Dahmer's confession, but also your, his a complete interaction as he was the main detective, along with another detective, but he was absolutely the main detective interrogating Jeffrey Dahmer. So what you did have from uh, Patrick Kennedy's widow was essentially how he did this, what Jeffrey Dahmer had said, and he was able to obtain identification of all the victims with Jeffrey Dahmer's cooperation and, uh, yeah, identification and details about all the, all of the murders to corroborate his confession that Patrick Kennedy elicited from him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so, da Dahmer very quickly uh, felt a rapport, obviously, with Kennedy and said, you know, I, I'll talk, but I only want to talk to you. And um, so there was something there that I think it was just Patrick saying, you know, like, hi, you know, <laughs> like introduced himself and he, he wasn't going to rough him up. Like there was a couple of other detectives who had kind of tackled him because they realized, you know, we've got somebody here who, who seems to be dangerous. And this was all, of course, in Dahmer's apartment. By the time Kennedy, who was a plain clothes detective, showed up, um, you know, he'd been sort of wrestling with the cops a little bit. He was handcuffed and they got him up. And I think he was just like a friendly face all of a sudden. And, and uh, Dahmer even said, are you going to beat me up too? And Do uh, Patrick said, no, I know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to hang out with you for a little bit and then we're going to take you downtown and then I want to I want to talk to you I want to hear what you have to say tell us a little bit more about Patrick Kennedy's background concerning his uh, religious upbringing and uh, before we talk about his assignment to interrogate Jeffrey Dahmer and his plan on how he would interrogate him? Uh, well, Patrick was a uh, Catholic, and I mean a Catholic, I think, all through his life, right up to the end of his life, and, uh, you know, I think he was a practicing uh, Catholic. Um, he found a lot of solace in the church, and in fact, even before, you know, he was embarking on any kind of career when he was a young man, or, you know, like late teens, early 20s, trying to decide what he wanted to do with his future, um, he really contemplated actually becoming a priest. Um, you know, he was not involved with the Catholic Church. I think he actually did some scholarship stuff with a, a religious school that he went to and attended. So he was really, you know, very, very involved in, in uh, you know, the Catholic Church. And then uh, Patrick had a drinking problem, like he was an alcoholic. And so when it came time where he decided, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I want to beat this, I want to get uh, past this, it, it was really through the church. Like he went through a counseling kind of program through that was offered to the church. So, so it was a really important part of his life, you know, I would say. I think the idea of the confessional, I think, was important to Patrick. And I think that idea of making it, you know, a place of sort of, uh, comfort for that person. I mean, no matter what it is that they're confessing to, you know, just kind of be there and say, like, I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to listen to what you have to say. That was definitely the way that Kennedy kind of, um, I think, became sort of a uh, somebody that Dahmer could or felt that he could talk to. Because we're talking about Dahmer, who uh, most people who knew him, the few people that knew him and those that knew him really well, would say, you know, in, under any kind of type of pressure or authority where, you know, he felt he was being confronted, he would just shut down. Like, he just would not talk. He had nothing to say to anybody, and that was it. So the idea that Patrick could say, well, you know, do you want some coffee? How about a cigarette? Have you eaten at all, you know, lately? Can we get you a sandwich? Like, this was all sort of uh, a humane thing that Patrick, or, uh, Patrick was doing and that I think Dahmer was 
responded to. Patrick knew as well, because of him being an alcoholic or recovering alcoholic himself, very quickly recognized in Jeff, like this guy I think has got a drinking problem. Like when he showed up, like when he came to the police station, I think he was just sobering up from an evening and night of drinking. And I think Patrick recognized that right away and said, you know, do you think you have a drinking problem, Jeff? And Jeff said, yeah. And Patrick said, you know, this is something that we can we can talk about. So between religion and sort of is there a God and what role does God play in your life plus alcoholism and sort of the effects that that has had in terms of, you know, decisions and things that he would make. Um, I think for Dahmer's, in Dahmer's case, it kind of gave him energy. It kind of gave him uh, confidence and some courage a little bit. And often he would say when it came to dismembering bodies and the things that he was doing, he'd often have to be very drunk in order to to be able to do that. So yeah, so they sort of connected along the way. Uh, but Patrick, before he became a, a police officer, he did come from a family of cops. But he actually went into social work first. And uh, he was working with um, ex-convicts. And uh, they were doing a program where they were working on houses. So they were teaching these guys skills, like construction and electrical work and plumbing. And then they would fix up houses in Milwaukee, sell them, use the money that they made and buy another house that needed some work on. And so this was to give these guys like something to do, something that wasn't criminal, and also to teach them some skills. So he did that for quite a long time. Uh, but his family was growing. He got married very young. He had his first child when he was very young, like 19, 20 years old. So by the time uh, his third child came along, uh, and we're talking Catholic private school, he needed a better career. He needed a career that was going to pay him a little bit more money. So I think that's when he decided to uh, join the police force. And he also kind of felt like, you know, I know the schedule. I know how it works. I know what it looks like to be a cop because, again, his father was a police officer. So he kind of knew what was expected of him. And, uh, yeah, so he very quickly, like, I mean, I think he went up the ranks and became a homicide detective pretty young. Uh, when he encountered Dahmer for the first time, uh, Pat was 37. Mm -hmm. You talk about this July 22nd, 1991, and anybody that's ever followed any true crime story or Jeffrey Dahmer story knows, so we don't have to go through it again. But this is Tracy Edwards is... Uh, found by police where so he flags down police with a handcuff around one arm and he doesn't really he just wants to get unhandcuffed unhandcuffed mm -hmm. and so he directs okay. the police to the nearby apartment of Jeffrey Dahmer and uh, he just he doesn't want any criminal charges he just wants the key to the handcuffs and Jeffrey Dahmer can't exactly. produce that so there's a scuffle with police after they take a look around they see some Polaroids of dismembered people and so while they're going through Milwaukee Police Department is going through there and the first thing they do is they look in the fridge and they see a severed head in the fridge staring at them. But Kennedy is not at the home itself. He is interrogating Jeffrey Dahmer. So the thing is, obviously, one of the main issues always, if not the main issue, is when the issue of whether this person will ask for an attorney. So mm -hmm. obviously, Dahmer says, I don't want to be uncooperative, but um, do you think I should get a lawyer? So what, is the, what does Patrick Kennedy do? Because this is a big issue. What does he say to Jeffrey Dahmer to convince him to keep talking and not talk to a lawyer? Well, he, you know, he kind of uses his Dahmer's you know, first statement, which is, you know, I really want to try and help you guys. And you know, if I can help you to tell you, you know, who these guys were, um, help you identify. Like he really, they, they were saying, this is what we need from you. And he is kind of agreeing to it. Um, Pat actually did go to the apartment, though. He, he actually, I mean, he did the interrogation and everything. And he wasn't the first police officer on the scene. There were some um, um, like uniformed cops that were there with Tracy. But they quickly called homicide as soon as they found the head. and, uh, and and Pat was actually at the police station with his partner and they were just getting ready to start their shift and they got that call. Um, they got that call, you got to go check out this apartment, something about a head in the freezer or fridge and you know it's probably nothing but you need to go and look at, you know, we'll go check it out and just say that we did it kind of thing and so that's how he ends up at the apartment and um, you know yeah Jeff had been kind of roughed up a little bit he was already handcuffed but that was actually when they first were introduced and I think that's too when uh, Dahmer kind of realized okay well maybe this maybe I can talk to this guy you know um, and so he kind of stuck with him the whole time until they got to the police station and that's when Dahmer said you know I'll talk talk but I only want to talk to him and so then uh, Pat's boss said, okay, you know, you're on this guy, you're like glue. Um, the thing about the lawyer, though, uh, that you had asked about was, um, I guess somebody saw these things on the news, they saw the name uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, and so they actually called Jeff's dad, um, you know, Pat, uh, um, 
uh, Jeffrey was sort of saying to Pat, you know, do I need a lawyer? He was kind of hemming and hawing a little bit, not sure. I kind of want to talk to you. I kind of want to keep going here. But I guess he was realizing I'm in really hot water. But it was actually Lionel, uh, Jeff's br uh, father, who was in Ohio, heard about what was going on and said, you know, I'm going to get a, a lawyer for my son. So he phoned a lawyer that they actually already had had some experience with. I mean, Jeff had been in some trouble before. Nothing like this, but had had a lawyer before. So he got that lawyer and he came down. And I guess this was really sort of the, the standoff almost. So, you know, the lawyer saying, I don't want my client talking anymore. They're saying, well, he didn't hire you. You know, somebody else had hired you, and we got to find out from Jeff what he wants to do. So, I, you know, I guess they could have said, well, your lawyer's here. Maybe you better just shut up. But they really wanted to, I mean, they wanted to continue him talking, and they were doing everything they could to kind of keep him you know, uh, uh, communicating with them. So they said, well, you can talk to us. I mean, you can have your lawyer here. Your rights can be, you know, looked after. But if you sign the, or say it on a piece of paper that you want to continue talking to us and helping us, then you don't have to go away to your lawyer. You can sit, sit here and still talk to us. So that's what he ultimately did. Um, though during the interrogation, uh, the lawyer did have his assistant sitting in through pretty much everything. Like she was there while he was confessing. Mm -hmm. You write, though, that he uses the, he, he talks to Jeffrey Dahmer and realizes that Jeffrey Dahmer does not want to go to the bullpen with everybody that's been arrested that night. Right. So he says, well, you can go down there if you want. But I know you, he realizes he doesn't want to go down there. So he says to him, you can continue talking. We can just talk about your past, to get, talk about your family. Yeah. So he just encouraged yeah. him to talk. So there was a, an interesting ploy that he did that. Now, all by himself in that room with Jeffrey Dahmer, he used that his Catholic upbringing, his experience in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. How did he use these aspects of his own personal life to be able to reach to Jeffrey Dahmer, to, to plead to Jeffrey Dahmer to help in this investigation? And what was that help that they actually wanted once they did get this confession from him? Um, well, you know, he was using religion. He was using a little bit of family. He was using the idea of, of drinking. And I mean, I mean, he didn't really want to come off, and he didn't really want Jeff to be sort of suddenly thinking, "Hey, if I just blame alcohol, then suddenly I'm not quite so responsible." Like he wanted him to sort of own, own it a little bit. But, but yeah, I mean, he really sort of, you know, sort of said, "Well, maybe this, you know, uh, affected you. Like maybe the, all this drinking and everything affected you." Um, and it certainly, like in terms of all of the major things that happened in Dahmer's life, like, you know, uh, schooling and going on to college and then uh, army, like everything he'd washed out because he had this, you know, consistent dr drinking problem. So I think I think what Pat did was he actually shared a lot of his own story, which I can't really think of that many detectives, homicide detectives that would do that. You know, like they kind of sort mm -hmm. of, they just want to hear from the suspect. They don't necessarily want to share anything about their own lives. But I guess for whatever reason, you know, Pat felt as though this is some way I can reach this this guy, and so um, some of that helps, I think, in terms of just you know, kind of using a bit of it as an excuse. Some of it as you know, a bit of you know, having him question why he was doing what he was doing. Um, but really, as you said, just get him talking, just kind of get him to go through each of the stories of each of the men that he met, and how did he manage to convince them to come back? Because don't forget, I mean, that's essentially how he operated. Uh, he wasn't going around abducting people from the street. He was making right. connections with people very quickly, like men, and. So Hey, why don't you come back to my place and we'll have some drinks or we can watch a movie or whatever. And I mean, you know, that was kind of remarkable. They needed Dahmer, though. They really needed Dahmer because back in 91, I mean, sure, DNA was accessible, but not nearly as accessible as it is now. No. And they didn't necessarily know what, you know, I mean, they didn't have like a list of potential victims because people hadn't, I mean, some people had maybe been reported missing, but I don't think the Milwaukee police really took those missing reports all that seriously because I think they looked at these photos of these very strong, healthy looking men and saying, well, you know, whoever this guy tangled with, I'm sure this person, you know, was the one that came out successful. They just didn't think of these as potential victims, whereas Dahmer was making them very docile. He was giving them drinks, but they were laced with drugs, so these guys were very docile and, and willing to kind of just you know, be a, be a victim for Dahmer. But yeah, they needed Dahmer to identify those people because between photographs and what Dahmer was telling them about dates, he was actually pretty good about remembering, oh, I remember meeting this guy at the mall, you know, it was summertime, and this is basically the, the ruse that I used to get him to come back to my, my apartment. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the ploys and the techniques that Patrick Kennedy employed to get this incredible confession to be able to identify all of the victims in the end. And it, 
took, like you say, the six weeks speaking to him every day. One of the things that was instrumental was the what Jeffrey Dahmer felt when speaking to Patrick Kennedy. He did not want to, he didn't want Patrick Kennedy to feel, Patrick Kennedy to judge him. And so Patrick Kennedy used a non-judgmental attitude towards everything that Jeffrey Dahmer said. And even some of the times, as you write in this incredible detailed confession, that there was times he had to walk out and walk out of that room and didn't even believe what he was being told till he got confirmation. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing that he used was that non-judgmental attitude. And when Jeffrey looked at him or his partner later on, they had that look of no, not the, the disgust that they probably would feel that they just had mm -hmm. this non-judgmental attitude. Yeah, like I think it, <laughs> I think it was, you know, like everything that he was telling them, you know, from the point of like, oh, I started to skin, you know, skin the, the victims, or I was, you know, taking the bones away, or I decided, you know, like I really liked this victim, so I wanted to um, experiment with eating this, you know, eating them. I mean, you can't, you, I can only imagine what these detectives were thinking, because I'm sure on the one hand, they thought this guy's crazy, and I mean, he's just, you know, making up these stories. But as you know, and, and as they found out from, you know, medical examiner and and uh, sort of what they were um, finding in the apartment because of course once they got him you know secured at the police station they were starting to go through this apartment Dahmer didn't even realize that right away you know he kind of sat up in his chair you mean they're going to my apartment now you know it's like well of course we found a severed head in your fridge we got to find out what else is there um but yeah I mean it was just like you know incredible like just when you sort of think okay well it couldn't possibly get any worse than this it somehow did but yeah they absolutely they kept it professional they kept it very you know calm Calm, soothing, um, and I mean, it, partly it was Jeff. Like, I mean, he wasn't a belligerent, rude uh, suspect. I mean, he was actually very polite. You know, he was, you know, kind of engaging. They, you know, they tried to point out a little bit when he sort of had a bit of a sense of humor. You know, I mean, he wasn't an unpleasant person to have to spend. I mean, what he did was unpleasant, but I mean, he himself was actually, you know, kind of just an ordinary guy. So probably wouldn't have gone quite so smoothly had he just said, you know, f the cops. I'm not talking to anybody, and you know, like started lying to them, you know, or or telling them. Exactly exaggerating or maybe sort of not giving all the information. I mean, he did kind of admit, omit things occasionally, but I mean, he always came forward with the truth. You know, if they, if they asked him about something, then he would tell them. But as you said, you know, he was kind of worried. I mean, after all was said and done, he was kind of worried about what they would think of him. Mm -hmm. In this incredible interrogation, Jeffrey Dahmer at some point gets real relaxed and, and Detective Murphy and Patrick Kennedy listen to these incredible stories, but of course they want to go chronologically through all of his victims. So he starts with June 1978 in Ohio and he talks about being pulled over by an officer with garbage bags in the back seat. And he's not really pulled over any specific reason, but the officer, this uh, Richard Munsey, is questioning him. So in this mm -hmm. interrogation, Jeffrey Dahmer is telling them about an officer in Ohio in 1978 that pulls him over. So tell us just a little bit more about this, this story that probably many people know, but also that Patrick Kennedy, once he hears this, needs to get verification of this story. So tell us just a little bit about the victim and then the verification of this incredible story. Sure. Um, well, there uh, in June, uh, this would have been around the time that Jeff was graduating from high school, he was uh, basically on his own. He was living in Ohio. He was living in this very nice house that his parents had. Uh, his parents were in the process of divorcing. They'd been kind of separated and they were in the process of divorcing. Um, his father had actually moved on with another woman who then became Jeffrey's stepmother. And in fact, they were married for a very, very long time afterwards. Um, and then, but his mom, uh, she ended up taking the younger brother to to um to Wisconsin. She wanted to go and be a little bit closer to her family. So here's Jeff in Ohio and uh, you know he's like 18, 19 years old and um, I, I think, I always suspected that he kind of arranged this a little bit that I think his mom who was so upset with his dad said you know like call your father and tell him that we're gone and that you're on your own here. I don't think he did that right away. I think he kind of just said you know I kind of like being this in this household by myself. There was access to booze. Um, he could kind of come and go as he wanted. No, no one was really putting any pressure on him. Um, so he was sort of living in this house for several weeks before his dad came and then discovered that he was living on his own and wondering where, you know, why why he didn't call for, uh, sooner. But anyways, while this while this period of time was that he was on his own, um, he had been out driving and he picked up a hitchhiker and there was a young man named Stephen Hicks and he was actually on his way to a music festival, but he had his thumb out and so Jeff picked him up and they started chatting and he said, why don't you come back to my house? I've got booze there. We can maybe smoke a little pot, whatever, and just kind of hang out, listen to music, kind of hang out for a while. 
while. So this guy went along with it. And so I think Jeff was quite attracted to the guy. And, you know, they were having conversations about school, about summer, music, whatever. And um, drinking and just kind of hanging out and partying a little bit. Well, eventually this guy said, you know, I got to go because I want to get back onto the highway and continue on to my music festival. And Jeff didn't want him to go. He didn't want him to leave. So they ended up wrestling around and kind of fighting a bit. And Jeff picked up a, uh, like a barbell handle, so the, the metal part of the barbell, and struck this kid in the head. And so he, of course, was unconscious. And then Jeff, um, I think he did some things, first of all, and then he ended up strangling this, this young man. And uh, he was quite freaked out. You know, of course, this was his first time ever doing anything like this. And uh, so he was, you know, I think on the one hand, very sexually excited, but at the same time, he was also terrified because what happens if somebody finds out? So he ended up um, destroying this young man. He cut up the body and there was into, into body parts and he put these body parts into these big bags and uh, one night, very late, he was out driving and this cop, this uh, Officer Munzee, pulled him over and I think the reason he actually stopped him was because it was like a, a quiet kind of country road and there was this one car that was kind of not really swerving but it was kind of just not driving all that straight so the guy said ah probably some teenager who's been drinking I better pull him over so sure enough it was Jeff and you know he was a young teenager and so uh, he said to him you know have you been drinking tonight young man and Jeff said well way earlier I was hanging out with a friend and we had a couple of beers but you know I'm not drunk now and so the officer sort of had his flashlight and he's looking in the car Car. He's like, what's with all these bags in the back seat? So Jeff very quickly, thinking on his feet, said, well, actually, it's their garbage bags, and that's where I'm headed now. I wanted to go to the dump. My mom asked me to do this earlier, and I'd forgotten. And she's really upset right now because she and my dad are going through a divorce, and I just thought this would kind of cheer her up if I kind of, you know, did something that she had asked. So kind of a lame excuse, I guess. But anyways, somehow with the charm and the politeness, whatever, Jeff was able to sell this story. So uh, the guy basically said, well, you know what? The dump is closed. You can't leave bags outside so you better just head home. He did take the license plate information and the license you know, of Jeff down on a notepad or whatever but he basically just sent him on a way, his way. No ticket, no citation, just a warning and so Jeff made it home and I guess he was so terrified about the idea of maybe being caught again that he actually unpacked all these bags and he um, like crushed the bones and the body as much as he possibly could and then he scattered uh, what he could in the back woods behind this house uh, in Ohio. So it was kind of a woodsy area so he just kind of like put the body out there and so fast forward 13 years or so and we're now in 1991 Jeff's been arrested and he's in custody and he's explaining to the detectives these victims and sort of how it all unraveled in terms of how he managed to find these men in Milwaukee but he did say, I had this earlier killing which happened in Ohio. So he went through and he told them the whole story. So they said, well, we're going to have to bring somebody from Ohio just to verify because they wanted to go through in Ohio missing records, you know, as far as missing men from that era, from the late 70s, and to see, see how many people could fit that description. So this detective from Ohio, during this period of time when detect the detectives in Milwaukee are talking to Jeff, they bring this detective in and um, he's got photos and they're out on the table and he's showing Don Dahmer, and Dahmer picks him out right away. He said, this is the guy right here, Stephen Hicks. And so uh, that's, that's kind of how they identified that one. And when he was describing with this officer from Ohio exactly what happened, you know, like I killed him and then I tried to get rid of the body in these garbage bags. I got stopped and uh, then I ended up just going home and scattering the bones and, and the body parts in my backyard. The officer who had come from Ohio later was talking with the two detectives and said, you know what, <laughs> that was me. I was the detective that stopped. Them. And it was actually Muncie that they, in 1991, sent from Ohio to Wisconsin to verify, either verify or discredit what this guy was telling them. So uh, they were kind of, I mean, Murphy, uh, Patrick's partner was said, you know, hey, you could have stopped this thing way back in 1979, and the guy was horrified, of course, but Kennedy very wisely, I think, and very uh, kindly said to him, you know what, he's lied and he fooled a lot of people, so don't feel too bad. But when they did go back to Ohio and they searched the grounds of the backyard of this house where uh, Dahmer had lived as a young you know, teenager, um, they did find actually the remains after all those years and they actually found a little piece of a retainer that belonged to the, yeah. the victim. So between that, they were able to go to the family who for 13 years had no idea what happened to their, their son, their brother, uh, you know, their cousin. Just, you know, he went off to a music festival and just disappeared and never heard, no, was never heard from again. Well, they finally were able to get the answers as to what happened and, and uh, confirmed that he in fact was a victim back in 1978.
Yes, and that's uh, incredible. Also, May 26, 1991, again, anyone that has ever looked at this Dahmer story is aware of this 911 call. A woman calls to report a young man naked, beaten up, can't stand up, needs help. Uh, meanwhile, the and she gives this, this young man, she thinks is a boy, a windbreaker to cover up. Two teen mm -hmm. girls come over as well. And the police officers come and, and basically don't really appreciate so much of the women telling them what to do or what they should look at. And they try to question the boy, but he is slurring his, his words. He can't really communicate to the police officers. And then Jeffrey Dahmer comes on the scene, uh, walking with a six-pack, and waltzes mm -hmm. into this crowd of people and, and tells the police that uh, it's his boyfriend. And certainly he's not young and he's uh, in his 20s. And he's a boyfriend, and, and often, this has happened before, he's naked and, and drunk and runs out of the apartment, and he's had to go get him. So the police, despite the women trying to intervene, go back to the apartment. And so Dahmer was able to convince them that it was his boyfriend by showing them photos of this consenting person in various uh, provocative poses. He couldn't find mm -hmm. the identification, but the police officers seemed to be impatient, or at least it seemed that Jeffrey Dahmer's explanation made a lot of sense, and they released this intoxicated or this young boy slurring his words, Who had been drugged. not realizing yeah. that mm -hmm. he was not realizing he was a boy and think he was an adult, and then they left. And of course, the famous conversations with the, the 911 officer and also the dispatcher, for everyone to know that they were very callous about the event uh, also though, but May 26, 1991, very much like the June 1978, when Patrick Kennedy and Detective Murphy are listening to these confessions, he's horrified to realize that, again, these police officers released this Luasian boy back to the clutches of Jeffrey Dahmer. So mm -hmm. as basically you helped him and, back to the apartment and right back into the hands of, of a, a serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. And so Patrick has, again, he's horrified because he knows that he is going to have to, someone is going to have to confront these police officers and this kind of information is going to be released and, and these police officers are going to have to, well, they will realize what they did that evening, mm -hmm. won't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so right. This kind of confirmation. Yeah. And you talked about the... Patrick Kennedy, too, keeping Jeffrey Dahmer talking during this interview. And Jeffrey did not want to talk to other people. There was, as you write, many or a, a couple times when there was people, FBI agents wanted to talk to them. The uh, attorney Boyle had sent his assistant, uh, Wendy Patricus, and Patrick Kennedy did an uh, um, admirable job in telling her, well, he, he hasn't requested for an attorney, so we're not going to let you talk to him. We're not finished with our investigation. But then, as you mm -hmm. write, a far more experienced, her boss, Attorney Boyle, comes down to the police station, and you write about how Patrick Kennedy deals with, with this attorney and his request to speak to his client. Tell us what, how Patrick Kennedy deals with this attorney and what this attorney actually gets as a result, maybe not what he wanted. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that uh, Boyle was basically just, you know, like, get my client out of there, you know, like, you know, arrest him if you're going to, but I just don't want you talking to him anymore. And um, and they basically just said, you know, he's grown. Like, I mean, you know, yeah, you got a call from the dad and you know him. He has been a client of yours previously uh, for some other, you know, infractions that Jeff had, had done. But, um, you know, like we, you know, he's willing to talk to us and we are going to continue questioning him and um, so I think Boyle you know I mean he was really upset and frustrated and uh, you know I mean of course they don't they don't know all yet that's sort of coming I mean it's just sort of starting to unfold so they don't really even know yet how bad it's getting I mean they just they just know it's bad but they don't necessarily know the number of victims and what exactly Jeff was doing with these victims and you know how many close calls there had been you know where Jeff maybe could have been caught earlier um, you know they don't know any of that yet so um, I mean I think Pat just really stood his ground and I mean personally he knew like I think I can get through to this guy I think I can talk to Dahmer and I can get him to confess to me he likes me he's he's expressed you know like when I leave the room he's where are you going <laughs> are you coming back like he's very much th there was something in there like there was a rapport there, and, and Pat was not just going to let the lawyer kind of come in and do his singing and dancing and, and uh, whisk away the, the client. He was just determined that this is going to, you know, this is going to happen because Dahmer wanted to talk to the police. He said he seems like he's ready to confess. 
So um, they agreed, they did agree that somebody, like some legal representation should be in the room. Um, and Dahmer, um, or, sorry, uh, the Dahmer went along with that as the, the detectives as well. And I guess from that point of view, it was like, you know, we don't want to, uh, we want to make sure that when this case, whatever happens, goes to court, we want to make sure that, you know, uh, we haven't violated Jeff's rights. But they didn't. I mean, he said, I want to continue talking to you. I know my lawyer's here. I know he wants me to st stop talking and to shut up, but I want to keep talking. And he said, I want to help. Like at this point, I'm caught. There's really nothing I can do. I know I'm going to be going away for life. I want to help to um, to identify who these guys were. And don't forget, you know, at this point, uh, Dahmer is kind of like coming out of this, you know, boozy, drunken state. You know, he is sort of starting to realize like the implication of what's going to happen. And once he knows they're going through my apartment, all of my secrets are going to come out. You know, like he was basically just, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do what I can to make amends as soon as I can. You know, there's really no nothing he could do to uh, fully, you know, be forgiven for what he had done, uh, by, certainly by, not by the victim's families or anything, but I mean, at least the least he could do, I guess he felt, was to identify who the victims were. Well, it, we kind of skip over the brilliance of, of Patrick Kennedy planting these ideas in Jeffrey Dahmer's head to the point where he leaves the room and comes back and Jeffrey Dahmer says, you know, basically, I think I know how to make amends, you know, after he planted mm -hmm. these ideas that the only way to make amends to really, again, to do something favorable out of this situation that was horrible was to identify the victims for the family so that they could have that yeah. peace of mind. And so he right. agreed to that, but, but Patrick planted all of these ideas for that something beneficial could happen from this. And what I also, which you don't really write about, but we have to realize that Patrick Kennedy is a, a, is a handsome man. He's six foot seven and 265 pounds with, you, as you write, a very gentle nature. Mm -hmm. Now, Jeffrey Dahmer, in this interrogation, it's incredible how, again, this vicious, remorseless, psychopathic killer is very vulnerable and childlike in that room. Even though he's, he's an articulate, intelligent man, he is very vulnerable. And Patrick Kennedy at least uses that fact to be able to reach Jeffrey Dahmer at first when, you, like you said, he was in a sort of a drunken stupor still. And then he kept coming out of it and they kept feeding him coffee and cigarettes. And, and as you write as well that cigarettes and coffee were again part of the motivation. Jeffrey Dahmer thinking that he had a you know had yeah. a nicotine addiction. So cigarettes and coffee and later on donuts and just a non judgmental, even friendly discourse many times. And and as you write too, that when he was writing out the confession, when they wanted to get all of the details so they were able to identify the victims, that uh, those details those incredible details were, were forthcoming for Jeffrey Dahmer. He acted you write or Patrick writes, that it was like therapy to him. He seemed mm -hmm. like he was talking to a therapist during this entire, again, uh, many, many weeks of interrogation. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you kind of have to think like all of this is kind of kept us inside Dahmer and you know, regardless of what you think of him in terms of as, as a person, I mean, you know, there must have been some sort of, I mean, he must have known, okay, well, I'm done. I mean, I'm going to be in prison. And that's it. I'm never going to see the light of day. Um, and I also have to live with what I've done. People are going to be referring to me as a monster. My family, you know, they're going to be affected um, because of the last name and that, that connection. You know, they're always, oh, you know, Dahmer, are you related to <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer? And, uh, you know, so, I mean, there was definitely, um, I think there must have been some relief in a way for Dahmer to just be able to kind of like get it all out you know like I mean probably he in the worst way he never thought he'd ever have to or he wouldn't want to do that but I think in that particular interrogation room with that particular detective at work I mean Jeff could have also I mean he could have shut down that was sort of one option the other one is that you know he was a very like kind of a charming guy like he could be charming when he wanted to very polite you know yes sir no sir very deferential and I mean he could have just like said all these nice things to to uh, Kennedy, but lied. You know, I mean, that's how he managed to get away with, you know, the, the cop in Ohio and the cops on the street with the young Laotian boy and, and other people where he was, you know, uh, parole officers in, in the past and other people where he was able to just kind of like, hey, everything's a okay nothing to see here, or nothing to worry about here. Um, you know, and I mean, because he was just sort of a nice guy, they all kind of said, ah, you know, if anything, he was boring and bland, you know, as far as they were concerned. Like, no, nothing, this guy is not capable of really anything, you know, um, other than some of these little skirmishes and things that he had been involved with 
previously. Um, so, I, I mean, I always think it's a fine line because I know a few people have said to me, well, you know, I mean, once they had him, I mean, what else was he going to do? Of course he was going to confess. Not necessarily. He, he could have shut no. down. He also could have just lied and lied and lied, you know, and uh, just denied at all, you know. But, I mean, not only was he confessing, there's actually, there was one charge that they ended up um, dropping, uh, like it was, they had a victim, they had, I think they had a name and he had actually identified somebody, but they couldn't find anything of this victim. Like in the other the right. cases of the other victims, there was either a skull or there was a driver's license or there was something that belonged or was part of the victim that they could say, okay, he was, he's guilty and he killed this person because we have something of that person. Well, there was one victim that they had absolutely nothing of that person. And so they decided, you know what, we're not going to charge him for that because we really, you know, if it should come that, you know, he appeals or whatever, that could cause a problem later on because we don't really have any evidence of this. So he was actually confessing to crimes that he had committed where they really couldn't have pinned anything on him because they had no, truly had no evidence other than just his word. But they attempted a few times, you know, they sort of thought this is this seems a little too easy, you know, like he's just kind of forthcoming and whatever it is we're asking him, he is telling us. And so they did attempt to try and trick him a couple times just to see if they could catch him in a lie, uh, something that they knew that they didn't think he knew that they knew. And uh, But every single time they tried to catch him or, or catch him in a lie, he, you know, he surprised them. He was actually really, really brutally honest. Now we're talking about some of the things that Jeffrey Dahmer was saying in this interrogation, this brilliant interrogation by Patrick Kennedy. He had gained Jeffrey Dahmer's trust. We, you, we mentioned that there was times when they were asking questions, but this was further on in an investigation when they discovered that there was body parts in the fridge. And so they wanted to ask him about those body parts, about the, the idea, the notion that he would be eating some of his victims. And they asked him why he hadn't told them, why he hadn't divulged this material earlier. What was Jeffrey Dahmer's response to that question? Well, basically, he was concerned that they would think less of him somehow, that he didn't want to admit that he'd been um, cannibalizing some of the victims. Um, you know, he just thought that uh, that was just too horrible and that they would probably start to judge him or that they wouldn't want to talk to him anymore and that, uh, you know, that was the end of that. So uh, he didn't... Uh, he didn't admit that right away. He didn't tell them that. But when the uh, medical examiner started talking to the detectives and saying, you know, like, based on what you're, he's telling you about numbers of victims and what we're finding, there's some discrepancy here. Plus, we're finding, like, cuts of body parts in the fridge wrapped up, like, in butcher block paper, like it's meat. Um, and they weren't really finding a lot of food in the fridge, mostly just these packages. Um, so I guess they kind of came to that conclusion. So they did um, ask him about that and said, you know, there's there's something else happening. Were you doing this? And then he did admit it. But he was kind of concerned that they were going to just say, hey, that's it. <laughs> we're done with you. And, uh, you know, that that would just be really too too much, too, too, that he'd gone too far. Mm -hmm. Now, also, they asked about the boxes of muriatic acid. He also had this 57-gallon uh, blue plastic, what, what can you call it, bin, not a bin? Drum or container, yeah. Drum, mm -hmm. yeah, container, yeah, yeah, in his room. But what was, they asked him about the muriatic acid, but they also found a drill and drill bits. So now, they, in this interrogation, there's also talk of what he does with the drill. Right. Well, they, they found these tools, and then they also had found, like, he, he had, Dahmer had this kind of a weird idea of eventually kind of building a bit of a shrine. Um, he even had pictures that he drew out for them and, and that he had had in, in, I guess they found in his notes, uh, where, you know, he had sort of envisioned this, you know, big black chair, almost kind of like Darth Vader, you know, esque. And then he had these, like, skulls that were going to be kind of lined up. Some of them were going to be painted. Some of them were going to be natural. But he had this all kind of figured out. And so um, he, they did know. So in some of these skulls that there were holes in them that had been, where a drill had been used. So they said, you know, what's that about? And he said that initially, before he actually was killing victims, um, what he really had wanted to do was to basically incapacitate a man that he liked and basically keep that person with him. So they would kind of be half dead, half alive, that he would drill something and pour water into their brain. And it would just kind of like just make them not be able to talk, communicate, fight, you know, whatever, that they were just going to be. He could lead them around the apartment, if you will. He could sit them in 
in a chair. He could come home from work, tell them about his day. Um, he could, you know, fix dinner while they're sitting, the victim sitting there, you know, and, uh, you know, then he put them to bed and they could do things to the body. He didn't really want a dead body. He wanted an incapacitated body. Um, but the few times that he did try this, it didn't work. Like one person he was actually able to keep alive for quite a few hours. Uh, but when he caught, got home, he had laid out this person on a bed and that by the time he got home, this person had died. So he was unsuccessful in what he was trying to do with um, this drilling of, um, you know, drilling in holes in the head. Uh, but it, essentially what I c called it or what I referred to it is he wanted like a zombie boyfriend. You know, he wanted somebody that he could love, that he could feel would be affectionate to him, that, but he could basically just sort of manipulate and do with what that person whatever he wanted. And um, But it just, that didn't work. So then he ended up going as far as drugging them and then suffocating them and then he would be able to do whatever he wanted with the body. Because that, that was ultimately his goal, like because he wanted the body. You, you write a very interesting thing that I'd never read before, that he, he said that the reason he wanted to rape them and he didn't, want, he didn't enjoy anal sex himself. He enjoyed all the other aspects, mm -hmm. the touching, the kissing, oral sex, but he didn't like anal sex, so he, he wanted the ability to be able to rape them and mm -hmm. do whatever he, he wanted with the body, but he did not want to have to reciprocate, especially that anal sex. So That's right. it seems, yeah. seems like not great reasons for murder, but through this entire interrogation, Pat Kennedy gets him to ask him for his motivations. What is the motivation for keeping the heads, for example, he would ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he had these kind of strange reasons for things, you know, some sometimes it was, well, I really like this victim, you know, um, I, you know, I thought he was really sexy and I liked his body especially, or, um, you know, um, it, the, you know, there's other victims that he didn't really care so much about, so, you know, he kind of just would dispose of them, but not necessarily want to keep uh, body parts, maybe some other kind of little trophy just to remind himself of the encounter, but, you know, he was, he kept things, like he kept skulls, and as I said, he was sort of had this idea of a shrine with that. Uh, yeah, so he, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think it's unusual for killers like Jeff to keep things, um, but in terms of his motivation, like it was a kind of like what I had mentioned earlier in that, you know, he, he wanted a very compliant partner. He also didn't want those people to leave. That was his big thing. Like, I think Dahmer had a lot of issues with regard to abandonment. Um, and even this is maybe stemming from when he was a younger person in that, you know, he was living at home with his family. Um, his dad, I mean, he didn't come from a bad background. Like, I mean, his parents were caring. They had money. There was some wealth there, you know. So, I mean, I don't think that he and his brother kind of lacked for anything. Uh, but what they did have in terms of a family unit was a dad who was very much a workaholic and he was very very much involved with the work that he was doing so he wasn't around a lot and he also had a wife and then therefore Jeff and his brother had a mom who did suffer from mental illness and so there were times when she was in a psychiatric hospital or the times that she was at home sometimes she was you know uh, just not really available wasn't really present because she'd be sleeping or she'd be have taken some medication so she wasn't really you know the, the times that Jeff remembers of his parents or mostly they were fighting you know that, that was the thing that he remembered the most but you know his dad was gone at different times you know he's either working or he was off with his you know, girlfriend then became his wife. The mom left, you know, like she just kind of threw up her hands with this marriage and she took off with the younger son. Um, so there was like abandonment things where people were constantly leaving him. And so when he decided, I want to try and find a partner, um, he, that was the thing, was like, as long as they don't leave me. And so uh, there was one uh, instance I mentioned in the book where he met somebody who had actually come in from out of town. I think they met at a bus stop, like a Greyhound bus stop or something. And uh, this guy was in from Chicago, and so Jeff invited him to come and stay with him. And they went, you know, and had some drinks, and they went out and did some shopping. They made dinner. I mean, they had kind of like a weekend together almost, if you will. And, I mean, Jeff said it was like the closest thing to a relationship he'd ever really had. Well, Sunday night comes, this guy's like, i got to get back to Chicago because I'm due at work tomorrow. And that's when Jeff asked. It. You know, he's like, I didn't want him to leave. So he said, well, have one more drink. And that's when he laced it. The guy passed out. Jeff strangled him, and that was it. He was gone. You know, never to be seen again. What was contained in these interrogations, these confessions, though, was something not so understandable when you talk about, well, he just was a lonely guy, and he wanted these people to stay with him, and that's why he killed them. And, but there is other things that don't jive with that so much in that mm -hmm. his sexual feelings for every bit of that dismemberment process, he talked about slicing mm -hmm. the body open from the neck to the genitals and pulling out the viscera and sticking it on the mm -hmm. chest and the, the poor cops that had to see those photographs of, the, of this outside of the body, 
and also mm -hmm. that he had a particular interest in the hearts of many of these victims as well, well, or at least a few of them anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. just the, every bit of this, he talked about um, like intercourse with the viscera. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There very, was some very, very unique. strange things going on there, and I mean, that, again, that does go back to Dahmer's, you know, kind of childhood. Um, in that uh, he was very interested in roadkill, you know, like hey, he lived in this kind of like country type setting, and uh, he never, as far as anyone knows, he never killed any animals. But you know, he was very, very interested in going and picking up roadkill. He would you know scoop it or scrape it off the road and throw it into a bag and bring it home. And um, he had this kind of like shed thing that was on their property property that he would go and he would take these uh, dead animals and um, you know he would dismember them and he liked jars of different things that he would put things in and experimenting basically like putting acid in and seeing how long it would take for the fur and the skin to come off of say a cat so and uh, just being left with the bones like he was really very interested in sort of what he called the insides of things the insides of dead things and uh, a few people who uh, you know talked with him psychiatrists psychologists those those uh, kind of people who had that kind of um, experience and education were sort of thinking that you know like this uh, interest and in all this stuff about dead people or dead things and the insides of things kind of meshed around the time that he would have been maybe going through puberty. So somehow this sort of jived with his sexuality that he found. I mean, most people would find this completely distasteful, but I mean, he found that sexually arousing, those, those inside organs or those, those uh, viscera pieces of the body. I mean, part of him had to be really drunk in order to do what he was doing, but I mean, that was what he was very interested in. That was what he really was interested in, was the, uh, the insides of dead things, as he said. Mm, absolutely. Um, with this confession through this interrogation, they were over uh, the course of all those weeks, they were able to identify, uh, for example, they had uh, Munzee come with photos and, and to come to, uh, to Milwaukee to be able to uh, speak with Patrick Kennedy and look at the evidence that um, Dahmer provided, but they were able to get closure on 17 murders thanks mm -hmm. to Jeffrey Dahmer, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. And, and as I said, uh, you know, like this was before DNA. Um, this is before they had a list of potential victims. You know, they were really, I think, in a lot of ways kind of shooting in the dark. Um, they had to find photographs. They had to, you know, they did go and look through some missing uh, missing people report, but they also had like mugshots, you know, and I mean, it was just kind of like really kind of a scramble to sort of figure out and piece together who these victims were because um, it wasn't just, I mean, it was kind of a different story in a, in a way. Like if you think about, say, Bundy, I mean, there were bodies, right? There were bodies that were being found and they had women victims that were being identified and they, but they didn't know who the killer right. was, you know, it was just these body mm -hmm. parts and they figured there was somebody that was out there attacking women of a certain age that looked a certain way. In Dahmer's case, like they we come across Dahmer first, and then it all kind of uh, unfolds after that, and then it's sort of trying to piece together. He's saying, oh, well, I killed a lot of men, you know, and this is kind of how I did it. And they're trying to figure out, okay, who did you kill? Who and how do we find out who those people are? And again, at a, at a time when DNA was just not something that they could just, you know, randomly, oh, let's get this person in, and maybe it's a relative of this person who says they're missing. You know, it was really, really more of a, of a puzzle in terms of trying to figure out who all these folks were. Mm -hmm. They were actually quite amazed at Dahmer's recall in terms of, like, he could say, oh, I remember meeting this guy at this place around this time, you know, and so they were like, wow. So, I mean, he's actually, I mean, obviously these were meaningful encounters for Dahmer, but I mean, he actually had a pretty good memory. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too, when he talks about uh, living at his grandma's house and at first, um, you know, looking for work and then, and then also... Uh, going to church with his grandma and you know she was a very religious person but on the weekends and knowing her schedule he would meet men on Fridays um, want to keep them late the Sundays knew the trash was going out Monday so he routinely did things like pick them up drug them dismembered them destroyed them disposed them broke up the skeletons with a sledgehammer he found ways of effectively disposing of his victims didn't he? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Very much so. I mean, some he kept. I mean, they were in his apartment, you know. But I mean, between the acid drums and uh, you know, uh, throwing away and flushing down the toilet some smaller pieces of body, um, you know, he was act and, and cannibalizing, obviously. Um, that, yeah, I mean, there was very little. I mean, aside from what they found in the apartment that he was hanging on to specifically, you know, it was a head, it was a skull, it was this, this bone or that bone, um, because he liked the look of it or the way it felt, or you know, it was just something that meant something to him. But I mean, 
for the most part, he was actually to, able to dispose of most of his victims and, and, and have no one kind of come across it and say, oh my God, you know, I think we've got body parts here. We better call, so call the police and then having them investigate and figuring out, you know, like, how did this body get here and who's our perpetrator? I mean, he, he was not on anyone's radar. Like, I mean, there wasn't as though, I remember someone just recently saying to me, like, you know, oh, how could he have gotten away with so much when people knew there was a serial killer in their midst? It's like, they didn't know that there was a serial killer. I mean, there was, yeah, there was these missing men, you know, that I'm sure in some cases people were reporting. But again, they were like, you know, this is a healthy young man. Like, this man's not going to get into, into any trouble. Like, he probably just ran off or he decided he didn't want to live in Milwaukee anymore. You know, he's just gone. And they police didn't really do that much to sort of I mean, they might have taken a report or whatever, but I mean, I don't think they were really searching for any of these these guys. There did seem to be a little bit of knowledge within the gay community. Like I remember reading or seeing an interview with somebody who said, you know, there would be guys that would come to these clubs and then every once in a while be like, hey, we haven't seen so-and-so in a while. I wonder where he is. But I mean, no one really suspected that anything uh, was going on where they were being killed. Maybe just, oh, they're probably just not hanging around here anymore. Or they Maybe they moved or, you know, they're just, maybe they're in a different area of the city. You know, they were able to come up with reasons why, you know, Suddenly, someone who was there one day was not the next. You write that this the confession that he was giving was leaked to the press by a janitor that worked in the, the district attorney's office. They thought it might have been Patrick Kennedy. He didn't say anything, didn't submit to any interviews, but this confession was leaked to the press. And this story, as anybody knows, was just massive because mm -hmm. of the details that were emerging, heads in fridges and cannibalize, cannibalism and necrophilia uh, get everyone's attention. And the press mm -hmm. really, it really exploded over this case, didn't it? Absolutely. And because of the timing of it being occurring in like 1991, that's when he was arrested, was in July of 91. So 30 years ago this summer, um, just for your information, in case you didn't do the math. Uh, but yeah, so like 30 years ago. And um, like at that time, that's when like CNN and some of these 24 hour news stations were just kind of kicking off, right? So I think when they, you know, there's this story of a potential serial killer in Milwaukee, they did. They had the, the world's media show up for all the reasons that you mentioned. But I think also, too, just because of that cycling, they needed stuff to be showing, you know, hour after hour, and they needed cases to follow, and they needed a story where there was going to be developments and press conferences. And so, I mean, I think this case, you know, as horrible as it was and as terrible as it was for all the family members and victims' families, um, you know, the news uh, media really kind of jumped on it. At the same time, and I remember remarking, saying this to you as well, is that the Silence of the Lambs is huge and now turned into mm. a, a real franchise but Silence of the Lambs was a, a very very successful book and very successful movie just months before this you know real life yeah art that's imitates, right you know life imitates art so right exactly I think the movie came out in like February of 1991 and death was caught in July so in fact People magazine the week after he was arrested uh, referred to it as you know a real life silence of the lambs nightmare in Milwaukee and uh, so they really jumped on that you know the idea of a serial killer and I mean you know people remember the cannibalizing and the necrophilia of, of Dahmer but you know there was a period in there where he was actually skinning some of his victims and he had said to the detectives you know I thought it might be kind of cool to just wear the skin you know, and I mean, that's not that different from what the movie, the plot of Silence of the Lambs is. So, so yeah, definitely people made that connection of like, wow, you know, like what is going on in terms of like this tiny little apartment in Milwaukee and all this evil that just is happening, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, Patrick Kennedy, through this whole thing, there are people, one psychologist says to him, oh, no, the FBI says to him and his partner Murphy that they were suffering from Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome, meaning they got too <laughs> close to Jeffrey Dahmer and they couldn't be objective. Um, tell us what you write about the effect of this whole thing on uh, Patrick Kennedy, but also calls for him to see a psychologist. Uh, just tell us a little bit about yeah, well, I think the, the FBI, I mean, the, you know, the way that they're portrayed in the book, I think, is, you know, really much how De Detective Kennedy and his partner sort of saw this and she's like, you know, this is our case and we don't really need these guys to come in. Because they were saying all sorts of things, you know, you guys are getting too close to the suspect, you know. Uh, they were also quite amazed and thought, really put forward the idea, like, how do you know he's operating alone? Like, how do you know that he doesn't have, like, a, a partner who's complicit in all of this? And, you know, they were making some suggestions that, you know, Kennedy and, and uh, his partner, could they couldn't really put their 
finger on like why that they just knew that that wasn't the case. Like they guess I guess because they felt they knew Jeff well enough to realize this guy's a loner. Like he doesn't have really any friends, and you know certainly he's not going to sort of bring a friend into what he was doing. I mean, what he was doing was all very on his own, very isolated. It was all for his own pleasure. He was a very selfish person, you know, and it was all just for meeting his own needs, even if it meant killing somebody else. Um, so yeah, so I mean, they kind of scoffed at that a little bit, you know, in terms of, uh, and they, they certainly didn't feel as though they were getting too close to, to the suspect. I mean, they, they felt that they were using, um, I wouldn't say manipulating Dahmer, but I mean, that they were sort of using things that they felt that Dahmer would, would respond to too positively and that they, you know, they would just sort of keep, you know, I think in a way too, like it was almost like Patrick did be kind of come a friend to, to Jeff and maybe knowing, like this is a guy who probably doesn't have a lot of friends and if I kind of pretend to be his friend, you know, maybe it'll get us a little further. Um, his wife actually, Kennedy's wife, was quite concerned about his mental state and, and dealing with all of this case and was really worried uh, that he was going to uh, actually become an alcoholic again, that he was going to start to drink again, even after being sober for a really long time. But he said, this case is just so awful, like I could see you being driven to drink. And Pat wasn't really worried about that, you know, And but she really is, oh, I want you to go to counseling. I think you should see somebody. Um, they actually did bring in, I think, a psychiatrist or psychologist or somebody to come talk to them. Um, but for the most part, they kind of just said, you know what, we think we can handle this, you know. Um, I mean, it was a pretty atrocious case, but I think for the most part, they really did feel that they could handle it. Um, the case really was with uh, Kennedy for a long time after. In fact, I would almost say like right up until just before he died because he and I were even discussing like maybe this could be a book someday. Um, but yeah, I mean, for years and years afterwards, people who wanted to do an interview or to talk about Jeff and would come to the Milwaukee Police Department to say, who can we speak to? He was like the Dahmer detective. You got to go. You got to talk to Kennedy. He's the Dahmer detective. And um, so, you know, it was he was constantly sort of being asked about the case. What was Jeff really like? How did you manage to hear all of these horrible things and like not want to throttle the guy? I've, Kennedy went on to continue his uh, work as a police officer and, and a homicide detective for 10 years. So he did that, I think, up to 2001. And then he decided he wanted to go back to school. And so he went back to college and he actually became a criminologist and then started teaching um, other people who were wanting to go into law enforcement. But he said to me one time, he said, you know, the, the first week when kids would start showing up, the students would start showing up. He said, I always had like 300 <laughs> students because they would say, oh my God, this is the guy, the de Dahmer detective, you know. So he would say, you know, yeah, I'm going to kind of use a little bit about how we worked with Dahmer in order to, to solve the murders, you know, and figure out who all these people were. But it's not going to be the only thing I'm talking about. You know, there's other things that I'm going to be teaching here. So, you know, he was always kind of associated with this, you know, like he was always associated with the Dahmer case. And as I said, right up until, you know, a month before or, or Less than a month before he passed away, he was at a film festival that I met him at in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and it was about there was a documentary about the Dahmer case. So he was asked to be part of a Q and A, and then you know he and I were talking first about my article and then possibly working on a book together. So I mean, this was a. a career-changing, life-changing case. And I always, you know, to me, the remarkable, or one of the remarkable things about it is that just that idea of how, like, a phone call or a certain thing can happen to you and it can just change the trajectory of your life. You know, he gets this call. He and his partner, they're next up on the run. Kate, homicide, potential homicide. You guys have to go check it out. But, I mean, it could have been another detective just as easily, right? But here it was Patrick, yeah. and here he happened to be the right detective for this particular suspect, and then it went from there. There was talk, and there always would be when you get somebody like this that's uh, accused of 17 murders, that there's other jurisdictions that are interested in potentially speaking to him. One was because he did do a military term in Germany that they might want to speak to people that in, in there about unsolved murders and clear their books. But it was very interesting that you write how Jeffrey Dahmer responded to things like um, a request from Hollywood, Florida police regarding the disappearance and murder of Adam Walsh, who was found much later, just his head was found. Uh, 1981 disappearance from a, a Sears store, which I have, everybody knows is that uh, John Walsh then became this victim's advocate uh, and America's Most Wanted, uh, the host of and producer or co-producer of that program. What was Jeffrey Dahmer's response to that, that there was other victims in other jurisdictions despite his confession? You know, I, well, I guess I guess he felt as though, like, I'm telling you guys everything, you know, like, I told you everything that you need to know, and, you know, all the victims that I've explained and, and uh, described, you know, these are the, these are the only victims that there are. Um, I don't think any police anywhere, if they came across a killer like him, and, you know, anyone who committed more than one murder, would 
and also too, like say, you know, not a domestic murder, for example, where a spouse is killing another spouse, but when it's like a stranger on stranger kind of uh, case, I think that it's pretty much protocol that they will do a, a history of who that person is, all the different places that they lived and where, um, all the different cities that they were in and maybe visited during this period of time that they think crimes were being committed, and they will see, are there any other um, victims, homicides, and unsolved cases where, um, you know, those sort of things match up in terms of, um, you know, the kind of uh, victim that was profiled or uh, certain circumstances or MOs, you know, is there anything that's similar that we can maybe see if this person happened to be there and, and could have potentially been responsible for that current unsolved crime. Um, they did know that Patrick had been in Florida and it was around that time that Adam had gone missing and um, and I guess because of the fact that they found a head and then when they were investigating Jeff 10 years later they were head related I mean they found a head in the fridge and they found the skulls so they just really felt like this is a good tip you know we really think that we've got somebody here so they asked him about it they, they brought uh, people from that police uh, department to Milwaukee to sort of question Jeff and ask him about it. Um, he was actually very offended, you know, because he said, you know, these are like, this is a little boy. This is like a six-year-old boy because I'm only interested in men. Um, they did point out to him that some of his victims had been, you know, mid-teen age, and, uh, but he always maintained, I thought they were older. Like, there was a 14-year-old, he thought he was like more like 18 or 19, and the, another one that was 17, he thought it was in his early 20s. When he saw the picture of Adam Walsh, he said, this is like a little kid, and I'm not interested in little kids. Yes. You wrote, too, that Jeffrey Dahmer is very concerned about what Patrick Kennedy thought of him and also Detective Murphy, but also society at large and what his family would think once they discovered all the details of his murders and the other details like necrophilia. But despite that, he had received correspondence while he was in jail. Was he surprised at the celebrity itself and the kind of celebrity that he received? Um, I, to be honest, I don't really know. I mean, I guess initially it probably did uh, surprise him a little bit because he was coming to these um, these interrogation um, meetings in, in the interrogation room and he was saying, you know, I'm getting all these letters. I'm getting somebody who's asking me to review a book about another serial killer, you know, and, and, um, and I think after he was incarcerated, you know, he was like the most infamous prisoner they had where he was um, where he was being kept. And so he was getting all these letters and everything. So I think initially probably would be the same for anybody except for those that are really seeking out publicity um, like some serial killers really love the publicity that they get but I mean in Jeff's case I think it was pretty much benign about the whole thing but once he did start to get people wanting to correspond with him or sending pictures or saying things like you know like they just were interested in him because of the, the celebrity I guess but you know I think initially it kind of was surprising to him and uh, puzzling he didn't really understand it um, but then as time went on um, I think he kind of enjoyed it a little bit you know like they said that uh, somebody had gone to see him when he was in prison. Well, not gone to see him, but had gone to see another person in prison and happened to see Jeff when he was there. And they said, you know, he's, you know, a little bit different than when they had first met him. You know, like he was, he was well known in that prison. You know, people would walk by and be whispering, oh, that's Dahmer. You know, that's Jeffrey Dahmer. Or, hi, Jeff. You know, everyone seemed to know who he was and what his name was. Um, for the first part of his incarceration, he was in isolation. Um, but, you know, he was not happy in prison. Uh, I mean, he said, I deserve to be here. In fact, he felt he deserved to die for what he had done. But he said, you know, they don't have the death penalty in Wisconsin. So he was going to be facing years and years of his life in jail, probably the rest of his life in jail. And um, he was just, you know, like he didn't like it there. He was not happy there. Um, so eventually he did ask to be put into the general population. And they all said to him, like the officials at the prison said, you know, it's a death sentence, Jeff. You know, you are a marked man. Um, people don't like you here, you know, because of the celebrity, because yeah. you're so famous. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want to do that to you. But he insisted and he said, I'll, I'll take my chances. So I think he knew that actually he was marked and that someone would eventually get him. And when he was attacked, he actually didn't have any defense wounds on him at all. And that's a very hard thing yeah. to do. If someone's attacking you with something, you know, your instinct is to uh, stop that, right, to, to uh, stop the blows. And uh, he didn't have any marks on him, any bruises or anything. So he basically allowed himself to be beaten. It was, you do right that he said that he had found uh, religion in prison, found God in, in prison. So he continued, I guess, with the uh, work that Patrick Kennedy did saying that, listen, this is how you can make amends to God and to these people's, you know, victims of these families, but most importantly to God. So it seemed like Jeffrey Dahmer went along that path while he was in prison and then must have contributed to the decision for him to take himself out of protective custody, as you say, despite mm -hmm. advice. Mm -hmm. 
contrary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, in the end, you know, he did find some peace, some you know, whatever peace he could, you know, through religion. Like he seemed to get quite involved in the, you know, the with the prison chaplain there. Um, got to know him pretty well, and I think, you know, I think that, um, I mean, he was very shy. Like Jeff was a very shy person, but I mean, I do think he liked to have these kind of conversations, you know, and to hear what other people thought about religion and you know, kind of how that fit into his mindset and and uh, you know, and, I mean, I guess too, it was something to do, maybe something to focus on while he was. In prison. It's very interesting, too, when you write that Kennedy observes when Jeffrey Dahmer recalls and recounts the crimes, especially when they got him to go through chronological order and then remember everything he could. So he undertook this task very seriously. And then Patrick noticed that he would go into sort of a trance almost reliving mm-hmm. some of the stuff, but he would definitely sound almost robotic uh, and be in a trance recalling what he had done so long before. Right, almost, you know, very emotionless, really, just kind of, you know, with the facts, you know, and not really sort of expressing remorse. You know, I mean, I think he was remorseful, but I don't think he really expressed it when he was describing what he was doing. It was very mechanical, the description. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, too, the support that his family still had for him during this uh, and then afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, his dad, I think, is probably the most visible and the most vocal in terms of support of Jeff. And, and uh, you know, he kind of came out right from the beginning of, you know, very apologetic to the, the victims of the families and, and apologizing really for what his son had done. Um, but, you know, he never stopped caring and loving his son. Uh, I think uh, Lionel, uh, Jeffrey's dad, Lionel Dahmer, really st- truly believed that there was mental illness and that, you know, he had gotten mental illness from his mom's side of the family and that that had somehow affected. Did, oh, Jeff in terms of what he became. Um, his brother kind of disappeared. He changed his name, and as far as I know, I mean, he might keep in touch with the, the family, but I mean, I don't think it has anything to do with Jeff. Um, the mom, apparently, Joyce, uh, she was living in California. She's passed now, but she initially, like when everything was sort of happening, when it was all unfolding in Milwaukee, and they were sort of, you know, day after day discovering more and more, um, she retreated. She didn't really have anything to do with him at that point, but um, she did get in touch with him as he was proceeding to court, and then afterwards words like she would have a Sunday night or every second Sunday night calls with him once he was in prison. So she did kind of rally around and support him towards the end. Not what he did, obviously, but just in terms of, like, this is my son. And when he was killed, she said, you know, that, that should make everybody happy now. You know, he's been he's been beaten to death and he's dead now. So that should, you know, that should put everybody's mind at ease. And, I mean, she was saying this in kind of a angry kind of a way, you know. Um, I think she believed it, you know. I mean, yeah, he was, you know, he deserved to be in prison for all this time, but he didn't deserve to die the way he did. Yeah. And so... Tell us just a little bit about the this manuscript. Just tell us a little bit more about your interaction with Patrick Kennedy's widow and this project here, presently growing Dahmer. Yeah. Uh, well, I after I had done this article, this is after you know Pat had passed away. He had a heart attack at home, and he was by himself actually. Because the, the the widow that I'm talking with, her name is Patricia. Um, this is actually Patrick's second wife. So this is not the wife that he was married to during the time that he mm. was investigating. Dahmer. That was his first wife and the mother of his three children. But this uh, second wife, Patty, is the one that I was uh, dealing with. And so um, after Patrick's passing, I had sent her a message just, you know, really expre- expressing my shock and, and remorse and, and um, you know, sadness that she had lost him so suddenly, so abruptly. He was only 59 years old. Um, he had, had just had, like, a little bit to go, maybe a month earlier, um, his sixth grandchild who was born. So, I mean, this was just, you know, a man kind of cut out in the middle of, uh, of his life. And so um, I was really shocked by the whole thing and really kind of quite upset. So I expressed this to her. But I said, you know, I do want to go ahead with the article. And so I said, once it's done and published, I will send it to you. So I did. And she came back to me and said, you know, like you did a nice job in terms of, um, you know, really kind of getting a good idea of sort of the relationship between Dahmer and Kennedy. And she said, you know, I'd like you to just take the notes, take everything that Pat lent you or gave to you and just do whatever you can with it. So um, it took a couple of years to kind of sort of put it all together. I mean, it's all Patrick's voice, but I mean, there was just some areas that needed to be kind of, you know, organized and coordinated and um, something fleshed out. There was a, a, quite a bit of the personal life part of his story uh, that I thought, man, you know, let's just stick with this, this investigation. So I cut that out. And um, and yeah, basically just really wanted to kind of tell the whole story of, of Dahmer, but also to use it as an opportunity to be a bit of a legacy to Kennedy as well. So just at the back, there's a little bit of a very brief bio about Patrick's life and legacy. And, um, and yeah, just basically, uh, it kind of just all kind of came together. Initially, I had some help, and this book did come out initially in 19, or sorry, 
2016 with the title Dahmer Detective. But um, it was very, very small print runs, and uh, but a lot of demand for it. A lot of people contacting me and saying, I, you know, I'd love to get mm -hmm. my hands on a copy of that book if it's possible. And um, just through some mutual friends that are into true crime and, uh, and really read a lot of it, I was able to connect with the fantastic folks at Wild Blue Press, and uh, they took yeah. a look at it and said, Yeah, we'll we'll reissue it for sure. So so that's how that all kind of came about, and that came about very quickly. Like it was just earlier this year that I, I had sent them some stuff with the idea of, you know, hey, would you guys like to do something with this? That they came back and said, absolutely. And I think also, too, being the 30th anniversary, um, there's also the Netflix film that's going to be coming out, I think, next year about Dahmer, like an episodic show about Dahmer. So, you know, it's amazing to me that, you know, there's still so much interest in this story, but there really is. There's a lot of people who are quite fascinated by Dahmer, interested to know more about him and, and try to figure out, like, why he was the way he was. I don't know if this book helps to that extent, but um, certainly by um, having access to somebody that really did get to know Dahmer very well uh, and talk about his crimes and, and sort of what happened there, um, I think that that's, you know, an important part of uh, Patrick's story. And it was, I didn't want it to not have anything happen to it because he passed away. I said, you know, there's no reason why his story can't still come out. So, so I made it kind of a personal labor of love mission to, to just get Patrick's story out there um, any way I could. Absolutely. It's a, an extraordinary look at, a, at one of the most brilliant police investigations ever, and one of the most important ones, given the gravity of everything and what was at stake. Because if, if, if a lawyer might have been able to speak to him, especially given that the DNA, uh, without his cooperation, there's just no way this story would have been told, but also the, the identification of many of those victims. It's also a glowing tribute to Patrick all of his police work, but um, and also a, 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 just a tribute to what he was able to gain from Jeffrey Dahmer. And now this book, Grilling Dahmer, is... And, and for all those people that think they know about the Jeffrey Dahmer story, without this interrogation and without Patrick Kennedy's interrogation, we would not get to realize so many of the things that we now believe and know about Jeffrey Dahmer. So I think this is essential reading grilling Dahmer or anybody that thinks they know the entire story. So I want to thank you very much, Robin Maharaj, for coming on and talking about your new book, Grilling Dahmer, The Interrogation of the Milwaukee Cannibal on Wild Blue Press. And just tell us where they might take a look at this and also when is the release date? Um, well, it's coming out later this year. I don't know if I have the exact release date, but people can actually order the ebook, um, and that's available on Amazon. And um, they can also, I think, go right through the publisher, so wildbluepress.com. And um, yeah, I think Amazon. And it'll be available, I'm sure, in bookstores and... Um, yeah, it'll be out there. And the ebook is available right now. It is available now, yeah. Okay. I want to thank you very much, Robin Maharaj, Grilling Dahmer, The Interrogation of the Milwaukee Cannibal. It's a brilliant book. Thank you so much for this interview. You have a great evening. Good night. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Take care. Bye-bye.